Thank you for being part of our October 23rd Lessons of Vietnam show by the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated. I am Bill Dixon, President of North Carolina Vietnam Veterans. My co-host Bob Matthews will be with us uh, uh, shortly with our guest. But first, uh, call 919-518-9773. Give us your comments or your questions. Tonight's show is special in the teaching of the Lessons of Vietnam. First, my co-host, friend, Vietnam veteran Bob Matthews has been an educator for more than 40 years. He felt that the paragraph that was used in social studies textbooks was not adequate to represent such a pivotal time in this country. Bob, with the help of other educators uh, and veterans, wrote a full curriculum uh, course that has now been uh, used nationwide. Bob taught the first of the uh, pilot course at Enlo High School, uh, get it all set up, uh, Enlo High School here in Raleigh. He taught the course for several years, and we will be presenting this course at the National Social Studies Conference in St. Louis, Missouri at the end of November. The course is easily adapted to fit any school, district, and style, but one of the vital parts of this course is the teacher that is guiding the students through the curriculum. We have enjoyed over the years some of the top line teachers over the years with the Lessons of Vietnam curriculum. Tonight our guest is one of those above beyond educators. Okay, not yet, I'll tell you. Uh, Russell Page is a superior teacher at Cary High School. Both, both Russell and his wife have served our country in the military. I believe Russell was a captain and his wife was a major. Uh, so he got bossed all the way. Uh, again, please take a moment uh, of your time to call 919-518-9773 and take advantage of these two renowned educators. Ask them why teaching Vietnam is important or whatever you want to ask them. Our next show will be November 13th, and Bob and I will be doing the show from the road returning from McAllen, Texas. If you know someone in the McAllen, Texas area, please tell them about all the things we're going to be doing down there. Uh, from November 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, uh, we're going to be doing down, down in McAllen, Texas, right on the border, uh, just outside of Brownsville. Uh, we're going to be taking our uh, replica of the Vietnam Wall, just like the one in D.C., with us. Uh, one of our members who is a pen and ink artist, a uh, very talented young man by the name of um, uh, Ron Harris, he uh, is all to add to his accomplishments as a pen and ink artist. He has written a play uh, called The Etchings in Stone, and it's about the Vietnam veterans from Moreland, D.C., and which will be presented at Nicky Rowe High School there in McAllen. Uh, Ron was going to be with us tonight, but he couldn't come, so... I would just take a moment. I hate to read, but I'm going to read something that uh, he wrote up about the uh, about the play. Dickey Road Drama Department with the community help will perform a play called Etching in Stone. It's about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the wall in Washington, D.C. It's also about the personal experiences of veterans and their loved ones and just ordinary people who visit the wall. The play is moving and emotional because it addresses a wide range of issues concerning the Vietnam War. The issues range from POWMI, Agent Orange to survivor guilt, and how vets were treated when they returned home. Uh, the people down in McAllen, Texas, are going all out of their way to put on a, a fantastic play. Uh, we'll have the wall there, which we'll be able to do printouts and rubbings off the wall for the people of uh, the three counties supporting it there. So what we're going to be doing, since we're going to be there during the show, uh, on the way back, we'll stop and do uh, the sh show uh, through Skype. Uh, from the Nicky Rowe High School. If you don't know who Nicky Rowe was, he was a uh, pre-OW. Uh, he was captured with Rocky Versace and Dan Pitzer uh, early on in the war, I think it was 65. Uh, Rocky Versace was recently uh, uh, possibly awarded the uh, Medal of Honor uh, for his uh, activities there before they uh, assassinated him and killed him right there. Uh, Nick uh, escaped and was later assassinated uh, uh, several, many years later, he was assassinated in the Philippines uh, riding in a bulletproof car. He was investigating the communist insurgency when he was assassinated. But he's from McAllen, Texas, and uh, so we're going down to honor him and his memory and the kids down at, at Nicky Rowe High School. Uh, they're called the Warriors, which is uh, basically, uh, that's what Nick was. If you want to have more information, 
just contact Mark Watson in McAllen at 956-457-4856. And then Mark can set you up with uh, tickets to the show. It's a free show uh, but for veterans, but uh, you do need tickets because it's... Uh, uh, Auditorium only holds 500, and he's planning on having a, a big crowd uh, for two shows a day. Uh, also, today is uh, a very special time in history. This is the 30th anniversary of the bombing of the Marines Barracks in Beirut. Beirut, excuse me, my southern tongue sometimes has problems with that. Kind of one of the first uh, experiences we had in a long time, starting the terrorist effect, effects we have today. Also, I want to do a public service announcement here. Uh, a lot of veterans have a lot of questions about uh, Social Security and so forth. Uh, this organization, uh, I'm going to give you an address and I'll tell you about it. It's www.socialsecurityforveterans.com. They normally charge $49.95 for you to go on and get the information about your Social Security and so forth. But on Veterans Day this year, you can go on that website for free, and they don't charge you anything, get information about Social Security and how it affects you and when you should take it and what it will cost you if you take it before 1965. Uh, after we see the month of October uh, in Vietnam, uh, Bob and Russell will be with us. Just remember your questions and comments. Give us a call, 919-518-9773. Ask them some hard questions. Get them some really in-depth questions. And uh, make them sweat a little bit uh, as you go. When you were searching for my name today, I saw you standing there. Man, you look different. With that silver in your hair Me, I haven't aged a bit Still all of twenty-one That's the thing about us spirits We're forever young at the wall Here at the wall We were proud to serve our country when called by Uncle Sam Then more than a little anxious Then they shipped us off to Nam Remember all the heat and bugs Days marching through the mud Constant gunfire, smell of death Sight of all that blood Some gave all The names carved in this wall But it's a wall of love, a wall that heals, a wall that touches, helps you feel the faces of more than 50,000 names. Feel the wall be forever changed. When we finally got the orders, Saying we could go back home They were looking for my body So you made the trip alone Came back to a country I Couldn't comprehend How so many boys that left Returned as messed up men Who served with all the Names here on the wall yeah, it's a wall of love, a wall that heals, a wall that touches, helps you feel the faces of more than 50,000 names. Feel the wall be forever changed. As you stand there weeping With your fingers on my name Share with those cute grandkids The reason for this place To restore some stolen gratitude and dignity 
This granite wall of honor that holds my memory. It's a wall of love, a wall that heals, a wall that touches, helps you feel the faces of more than 50,000 names. Feel the wall be forever changed. Welcome to Lessons of Vietnam. As Bill mentioned, my name is Bob Matthews, co-host of the show, and we have a very special guest tonight. I'd like to welcome Russell Page to the show. Bob, good to be here. Thanks for joining us tonight, Russell. Now, as Bill mentioned early, that um, one of the keys to teaching Vietnam, the lessons of Vietnam, and the whole historical perspective is to find teachers that are willing to teach it. And Russell, before we start with some questions and some comments about you teaching Vietnam in Wake County Schools, Let's talk about Russell Page for a bit. Um, I know you're kind of homegrown. You're a, a local lad, if you would. Will you give the audience a little bit of background? Because I do think a lot of the students and faculty want to know as much personal information as they can about a teacher. This is high school, college, and your background before you became a teacher. Um, born and raised in Raleigh. Uh, I was an old Rex baby. Um, raised here, went to Sanderson High School. Um, graduated from there, went to uh, Campbell University. I see. Um, graduated from there. I was a ROTC uh, graduate as well, so uh, served a, a, a brief stint uh, in the military. Uh, went to Fort Sill uh, for field artillery officer basic course. Um, after that, returned to the area, joined a reserve unit, and uh, was in the reserves for about 10 years. Oh, I see. And uh, was in the business world and did that for um, uh, up until about 1995. Uh, and uh, was living out in Colorado at the time, wanted to return back to North Carolina. Uh, came back here uh, and decided to become a teacher. So I went back to school, uh, got my uh, uh, graduate degree in uh, secondary social studies, uh, met my wife uh, in graduate school. Very and nice. uh, so, so I married, settled down, and have been teaching, uh, well, did my student teaching at Cary High School. And uh, I liked them. They seemed to like me. And uh, so I've been teaching there ever since. So that's my 17th year. 17th year teaching. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Russell... I'll be the first to tell you this, and at least first tonight on the air. You're doing a, a great job teaching Vietnam. And one of the reasons I say this is because what I said earlier in the show was the key to understanding Vietnam is having a teacher that wants to understand it. It's a very hard class to teach. And I know in your background during your travels, you actually went to Vietnam. Right. Uh, back in 2008, um, went with a, a group organized by... Uh, um, NC Tan, and uh, it was myself and about 20, um, 22, 23 other teachers. Uh, went to uh, Vietnam, went to well, China and Vietnam, spent uh, uh, about uh, uh, four weeks over there, two, two wow. weeks in uh, China, two weeks in Vietnam, and uh, got to travel the country from Hanoi all the way down to the Mekong Delta, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, it had, was a real treat for me because I was already a Lessons of Vietnam teacher prior to going. Oh, sure. sure. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly had associations with yourself and a lot of the uh, Vietnam vets there, so a lot of the stories and things that I'd heard from you guys, I was able to see these things firsthand. <laughs> they were true. And, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, and, and especially about the Mekong River, when I got a chance to see that, uh, things that I'd talked to Al Ely about, uh, that kind of oh, yes. came to life. So it was a, it was a great experience for me. And, uh, and that's really helped to inform my teaching uh, since that time. Well, oh. Russell, what I found when I first started to teach, there were certain teachers that had specialties. They liked maybe politics, they liked maybe government, maybe the economic part of it. Why in the world would you sign up to teach Vietnam? Well, it's actually a class I lobbied for. A lady by the name of Linda Gunter had taught the class. Um, in fact, I believe she may have been the initial teacher to teach it at Cary High School, she if I'm not mistaken. Um, and... Um, uh, as she retired, uh, I, I saw that, the, that I wanted to see that class continued, um, and I saw the opportunity to, to, to uh, take over that uh, after her retirement and uh, kind of pick up the ball from there. 
And so I lobbied hard to get the class, and uh, really, uh, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, I didn't have much competition for that, so I was able to, to get that assignment and have taught that ever since, since about 1998, I think it is. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it, it was a blessing for us. When Linda was a good teacher, I knew her very well, and when the, when the torch was passed, we were hoping Cary High School, one of our strongest schools in Wake County, would get a very solid teacher that would continue the tradition of teaching lessons in Vietnam, and we're very pleased with what you've done over the years. You've become an excellent teacher and begin getting better every day. My question to you with the lessons of Vietnam is, as Bill mentioned earlier, when we started this course several years ago, the key was finding teachers that would teach Vietnam along with their other load because most of them had very little experience in Vietnam. And it's very hard to find a Vietnam veteran that is a teacher. I was very lucky. I just fell in, in the gap. I happened to be a vet that was a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing this. It seemed like I could talk teacher talk. So we start bringing in teachers, like you mentioned, Linda Gunter and Link Page and uh, Jimmy Baum, mm -hmm. Lindy Poling, Esther Dunnigan, all these names in Wake County are legends. Mm -hmm. And they came in and they all picked up the ball like you have. And they've taken the kids on a trip that it would never take them on. So my first question about teaching NOM in Wake County schools, what is the hardest part of teaching Vietnam for you? Well, it's, it's a very uh, complex topic, as you well know. Uh, it's uh, a topic that's very controversial. Um, there's uh, uh, a litany of opinions about the war, uh, and uh, it does depend a lot on people's experience, those who were alive during the war, those who fought and served in the war, um, those that chose not to, um, those that were coming of age at that time. Um, so it is very controversial. It's very hard for sometimes people to get their arms around. Uh, a lot of teachers, and you are certainly a very rare exception to this, have not had really uh, any contact with the military. So they really don't understand the military for the most part. It seems to be kind of an alien world to them. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm not a Vietnam veteran, uh, but uh, at least uh, uh, my service, uh, uh, you know, I didn't fight for their freedom. I just showed up for it. Uh, you guys fought for it. Um, it did give me some insights. Uh, plus, it, I, I was a child during the war, but I, I paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, my, my dad was someone who watched the news uh, uh, every night, uh, and I would do that with him. That was kind of our time to be together. Uh, the kids sometimes don't believe it, but we had three channels back then, and uh, I was the remote <laughs> control. I would get up and change it from basically yeah. CBS to this is remote uh, ABC. Yeah. And, uh, you know, listening to Walter Cronkite or Howard K. Smith talk about the war, that was a lot of my education on it, at least as a child. Um, but growing up and uh, becoming a teenager, becoming a young person, seeing how Vietnam veterans had been treated, um, and then basically coming of age during uh, the Reagan era, sure. uh, that uh, really influenced my uh, outlook on the war. Um, I, I did not feel like then, and even to some degree now, veterans were given the... Uh, the uh, basically with respect and the, uh, the the courtesy that I feel like they were due from the country. And uh, given the opportunity to teach this class, I felt, you know, it's going to be tough, but I want kids to understand the veterans. Uh, I can understand them having various opinions on the war, people having various opinions on the war, and that's their right as an American to do so. It certainly is. But <clears throat> to me, the one thing that's, uh, uh, that's a very basic thing is the veterans should be treated with the highest respect because they uh, followed orders, they did as they were, uh, uh, ordered to do, uh, and they sacrificed. Uh, whether it was a draftee who sacrificed whatever time they spent into the, the guys who were lifers, who sure. uh, were professional soldiers, and that was part of their career, uh, they all sacrificed. And uh, to me, I have the highest respect for them. Well, Russell, when we first started the course and we were recruiting teachers, one of the biggest obstacles I had was getting teachers to not be intimidated by the veterans. And, you know, a lot of teachers have this thing with ownership. It's their classroom, their chalkboard, and all this kind of thing. And they don't want to give that control up. And I've noticed in your class and Jimmy Baum's class and several teachers, a veteran comes in that's going to share with the students first-person history. They simply back off into the background and let history take over primary sources. My question to you, my good friend, is how do teachers get over the intimidation factor and let veterans come into the classroom and take, let's say, their spot in the sun? Well, I think one thing is personal contact, getting to know veterans. And uh, in my case, uh, when I grew up, uh, the one thing I loved to do is listen to my uncles talk about World War II. I would sit at their knee and just be enraptured uh, talking to them, listening to them talk. And uh, that was in itself just a great education because you can read books, you can see movies, but 
when you talk to the guys who are really there, uh, that's an education. And I remember growing up talking to them and getting the little nuanced details that you're not going to get out of a book or movie, but then later maybe reading something or seeing a movie and they included that and it says, yeah, that's happened to them and that's what they were told me about. And that, you know, that kind of confirmed, you know, their experience that confirmed uh, to me that, you know, that was a great source of information that's coming right from the horse's mouth. Excellent. Um, you know, I, another thing I wanted to ask you, too, in the early part of the show tonight is <clears throat> a lot of veterans and a lot of adults, once they graduate high school, they never go back. Mm-hmm. It's, like a, it's like a different world. Well, when we started writing the course, as Bill mentioned, and getting people and talking to the veterans, said, we have a major obstacle, a major goal, and that is to get into the high schools. And you saw a little bit of ice forming in the room. People were going, wait a minute now. You know, the number one fear in America is speaking in front of a group anyway. Mm -hmm. Most adults are afraid to speak in front of a group. And so as the veterans learned, and I mean they actually learned how to teach, and we have a great example tonight, Mr. Bill Dixon, as all the vets you know have become excellent teachers. They come in. But when they came into the classroom, did you notice a little bit of apprehension at first? Well, I I was kind of lucky. You you were uh, very much a mentor to me uh, in teaching the class and making contacts with a lot of the, the vets that did come in to speak and do come in to speak. Um, and, and I guess I, I had benefited from some degree from their prior experience. So the vets that I had come in, uh, courtesy of uh, North Carolina Vietnam veterans, were pretty experienced in that uh, uh, area. They uh, were comfortable talking to the kids. A lot of them have children or grandchildren. Sure. Uh, so they were fairly comfortable in, in talking to young people there. Um, NCBBI has done a great job in kind of prepping speakers uh, to take on that responsibility. And uh, uh, I know that Bill, on occasion, has brought in uh, some, some guys that have maybe not had so much experience in that area to kind of sure. visit or observe or to kind of chip in where, when and where they can. Um, so really my experience from that point of view is that most of the veterans have been very willing, capable, and mm-hmm. like I said, very, very uh, uh, well-established speakers. So they're, they're comfortable uh, and they're good teachers. And and to me, it's, it's the best teacher that kids can have because they can actually ask questions to someone who was there, who did it, and it's not being filtered by uh, uh, editing by sure. I, uh, uh, CNN or anyone like that. Well, so. well, what are the tricks? And is the, the, the veterans coming into the classroom, and I, I hope some other teachers are watching tonight because this young man next to me is a model for teaching social studies in Wake County schools. The different things he, he's done at Cary High School. When you go to speak to Russell Page's class at the high school, he meets you at the door, he walks you to his classroom, he introduces you to the students. You feel special, and you are special. As Bill mentioned, if you have a question for Russell, please call tonight, myself or Russell or Bill, Bill's in the wings, at 919-518-9773. But the vets were as intimidated by the seniors as they were by them. Because you start thinking about a man that was in the service years ago, or a woman, coming to the classroom and looking at 35 seniors, that's kind of scary. And all of a sudden, you're exposing your life, and you have that line that we didn't perfect, that we, we, we think we did. We'll answer any question you want. And you're thinking under your breath, don't ask that question. <laughs> Please don't ask the one I can't answer. So when you started doing this, and you saw some people come in, you said, what was, in your aspect, the hardest part about transferring the ownership of the classroom to the veterans? Well, um, I I don't really see it as a transfer of ownership. I see it as a cooperative uh, uh, arrangement uh, between myself and the veterans that come in, such as yourself or Bill, and and you guys have done a fantastic job at that. Um, I do try to prep the kids, though, for veteran um, uh, speaking, so they do know to have questions prepared, that type of thing. Mr. Page, we have have our first call. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, you're on. Uh, yes, my question is for Mr. Page. What do you find to be the most surprising thing to students about the Vietnam War? Excellent question. Russell, that's all yours. Okay, the most surprising thing for students? Um, I think that uh, the amount of time that we spent in Vietnam and the impact that Vietnam's had on our society, uh, I think they do find that kind of surprising because I'm not sure that really in U.S. history classes they're able to get into the detail that it really deserves, and, and, and you had pointed this out uh, at some time way back, I believe you were the source of this, that basically a kid gets up to use the bathroom, they come back, and Vietnam's been covered. Uh, and so in a regular U.S. history class, and, and I, uh, U.S. history teachers are very pressed for time, they have a lot of material to cover in a very short amount of time, 
but it, it sometimes just doesn't get the length of time I feel it really deserves. And probably they feel it, it doesn't really deserve. But because of other demands, uh, it's done um, in a hurry. Um, so I think students really, uh, once they take the lessons of Vietnam class, really start to get a different perspective on the impact of Vietnam on our nation's history to this very day. Excellent point. Because, you know, some of the kids you've taught, I'm sure you see years later, and they'll never forget you because you took them where they've never been taken before. And not only did you, did you take them to Vietnam, you stayed there for a while. Because, like I used to say, if you, get, if you have a dentist appointment, you, you miss Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well, forget the dentist. You take them to Vietnam every day for 90 days. And pretty soon it becomes part of their day. And as they get out of high school, it becomes part of their life, as you do. My next question to you. Oh, we have another call. You're no, Mr. No, same color. Oh, same color. Please continue. No, gone. gone? Okay. <laughs> My next question to you is that I noticed in your classroom, and I'm not sure of this, but have you had many women come in to speak? Uh, I've had a few and um, would like to probably um, um, do better on that in the future, but I've had women come in to speak that were wives of uh uh, Vietnam veterans, Mrs. Gross, for example, Kathy yeah, Gross. Kathy Gross. Right. Um, she's come in in the past. Um, I've had uh, women who served as uh, infamous donut dollies uh, sure. come sure. in uh, to speak. Um, I had uh, last year uh, on Veterans Day uh, a female Marine who had been a drill sergeant uh, during Vietnam. So she had not actually gone to Vietnam, but she had served as a drill sergeant at that time for women Marines coming into the military. Sure. Um, so that is a, a segment that I think that is, is, is overlooked. My wife is a veteran. She's an Army nurse. And so I think the contribution sometimes uh, by women is a little bit overlooked, and I think even I could do probably a better job of, uh, uh, of that uh, in the classroom. You know, I want to bring up something that's maybe a sore spot in Wake County, but it seems like today, and I may be wrong, and I want you to correct me here because we're coming from different generations of teaching, but is it easier to teach today with the sources at your fingertip, with the internet, with all the stuff that kids can get instantly, instant information. It seems to me when I come into your classes, the other classes I've been in, the kids are so much more, are so well informed. Is it easier to teach kids well informed or is it harder? Well, yes and no. And, and, and the way that it's easier, you have technology at your disposal, uh, PowerPoint, uh, and those types of technologies allow for you to show maps and photographs and uh, the, to show uh, depict, depictions that really only a textbook provided in the past and a lot of times not even very well. Um, so you do have a rich amount of information uh, to pick and choose from. Uh, the no part of that is uh, because there are so many things out there, so many distractions for students there, sometimes it can be kind of hard to break through and compete with uh, iPhones and mm -hmm. uh, their schedules and their interests and uh, uh, the other distractions they have there to kind of to, to get them to focus on the issue at hand. Well, I noticed in the, the makeup of the, of the classes today in social studies, it's pretty even, black and white, male and female. So what I'm trying to think, when you are thinking back in teaching Vietnam, and one of the lessons of teaching Vietnam is to give every student their day in the sun. Mm -hmm. Do you actually sit back and say, okay, I want to be fair here. I want to bring in a air war, water war. I want to bring in a black veteran, a white veteran, a female veteran. Do you ever try to get this, like the salad bar approach? Uh, I, I do try to get a cross-section. Uh, however, sometimes, again, due to people's schedules, due to timing, due to other things, that's not always possible. Um, but do try to get a cross-section. Do get, uh, try to give the students an opportunity to do presentations on uh, assignments and also enrichment-type activities. If they've done something that relates to Vietnam, I always encourage the students to go to the, to the monthly ceremony, the NCVBI. Sure. does at the state capitol, which mm -hmm. is the first Saturday of every month at 12 noon, um, which I, I think is a, a, a pretty moving ceremony, and uh, and I applaud you and your organization's efforts to, to put that on every month, and you do, I mean, w without uh, missing a beat every month. Um, and uh, I, I've been there in the, the cold, the rain, the oh, snow, yes, and have. seen, yes, uh, seen the, the commitment that uh, NCBBI has to our uh, Missing in Action um, uh, soldiers from uh, North Carolina. Uh, also encourage the kids to come to things like the Veterans Day Parade, to go to the sure. Airborne Museum down in Fable, do things that are in the area that they can participate in. And to me, the best learning really sometimes takes place outside of the classroom. You're right. Um, You're right. If you can go there, see it, experience it, touch it, talk to a veteran or whatever, 
that, that's going to be so much more memorable than something you read in a book or something you talked about in class. And that's why I really strongly encourage students to do outside activities. Again, it's very difficult sometimes with their schedules sure. and maybe their interest or motivation levels to get them to, to go that extra step. But it's a viable one, I think. Thank you, Russell. Another call. Go ahead, sir. Yes. What is your favorite part in teaching the LOV curriculum? Okay. Russell, that was, what is your favorite part of teaching Lesson of Vietnam? Um, your favorite section? Well, um, I, I really enjoy uh, teaching about the, the military side of things, um, the strategy, uh, looking at uh, 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 maybe some of the misunderstandings people have about the war. Mm. I think especially just recently, uh, if, if people were following the news, uh, General Jop, the uh, uh, commander of all North Vietnamese forces during the war, just died at 102 years of age. Yes, he did. And uh, the write-ups you see in the paper gave him great credit for being a great general. And if you look at the reality, he was willing to spend the lives of his soldiers very freely. Yes, he was. Um, yeah. And if that's what makes you a great general, then I guess he earned it on that basis. But he, he built his reputation on the bodies of a lot of his own soldiers. And um, I, I think we need to look kind of critically at that. Is is that great generalship that you're willing to throw away uh, lives needlessly or uh, lavishly to accomplish a goal? Um, I, that That's something I think that needs some critical determination there. Very good. Um, there's also seems the mythology that the, the Vietnam uh, was uh, won by guerrilla warfare, and, and one thing I try to take pains to point out to the kids is that uh, it really, if you look at the war as, as bookends, it started out very conventionally with the Idrang Valley. Yes, um, it did. In 1975, you had uh, uh, North Vietnamese tanks rolling into Saigon. Those were not guerrillas. No, no. Uh, they were not Viet Cong. In fact, the Viet Cong was very quickly expunged after the North Vietnam took over South Vietnam. Well, this is one thing that. I've always appreciated about your style of teaching. You leave no stone unturned. You take the hard questions, the easy questions. Uh, our caller, ma'am, are you, are you gone or are you still there? You're gone. Okay. What I want to get to next is this. is um, When Bill mentioned this course started at Enloe High School, and you, as you mentioned, you succeeded at Linda Gunter. Mm -hmm. I have found in a major school in Wake County the success or failure of a new elective course deals with the cooperation of the faculty, of the staff. Mm -hmm. How would you evaluate where you have been, the staff helping you, letting you do different things that you have to do with a Vietnam course to make it click? Well, I've been very fortunate. I've had a very supportive administration and a very uh, supportive faculty. Um, uh, in the past, I've had a very strong support from our uh, NJROTC program. We have a very fine program at Cary, as you well know. Um, and uh, Colonel Fight, uh, who well, yes. uh, runs that now, has, has done a, a, a super job in, in motivating the cadets. Um, Colonel Fennerty, who started the program and ran that for many years, uh, certainly deserves great credit, too, for that. And a lot of the kids in their ROTC program have, because of their interest in that, also taken interest in the class. But uh, other teachers as well, uh, as well, my colleagues have suggested that kids do have an interest in that period of history to take the class. A lot of AP U.S. history kids have taken the class a couple years ago. Um, one of the... Uh, 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 writing activities they had to do on the AP test concerned itself with Vietnam. It was a free response question, which you're familiar with the AP and the FRQs. Yes. Um, and the question dealt with Vietnam, and they just knocked it absolutely out of the park. There you and, go. Uh, there you go. They, uh, and, and they came back and thanked me profusely after that, saying that, you know, because of the class, they were able to shine on that. Um, well, that's what you need, because, yep. you know, as long as you teach school, you've taught 17 years, you're going to have down times. Mm -hmm. You're going to have times when maybe you say, what the heck? And you're going to have up times. But times like that, mm -hmm. when it pays off, when kids go out of your realm of your classroom and they get rewarded for what they did through you, it pays dividends a hundred times. Now, getting back to the lessons of Vietnam, mm -hmm. there are so many lessons we certainly can't name them all. Is there a subject that comes up in the classroom dealing with the Vietnam curriculum that you is your favorite or your least favorite? You'd rather not talk about it. Well, it, to me, I have interest in all of it there. Uh, I, I really am very interested in uh, what the home front was like during the 1960s. Again, my experience in the 1960s was that of, from a child's perspective um, uh, growing up at that time. So it's quite different from someone who was a young adult at that time as yourself or, or an older person at that time. But um, I, I'm quite fascinated by it all. Uh, I guess the thing that uh, does, uh, I, I guess, perplex me is a lot of the people that uh, were, were so vocal in their uh, dissent against the war now have uh, kind of uh, uh, changed uh, tactics a little bit or changed their 
their tune a little bit, and uh, those hearts. that seem to be so proud of their protest, uh, yes. especially against the soldiers now, are quite embarrassed by it, which, uh, yes, a- again, I-, I see that as a learning thing. They were young people at the time. Uh, they probably didn't fully understand the ramifications of it all. They uh, probably were very selfish in their perspective. And Good as they got older, they, I think they realized, and I think as we all get older, we tend to get a little bit broader view uh, of things. So. Well, you know, it it seems like one thing about Vietnam, and I talk to all the teachers who teach Vietnam now, they each have an area where they're not real strong on. Now, one of the teachers called me the other day and said, how do you handle, how much time do you spend on draft evasion, the people that ran, mm-hmm. the guys that didn't serve, the guys that had fake deferments? Is it worth class time telling the kids and discussing with the students the awkward lessons of Vietnam? Because there are awkward lessons of Vietnam. Sure. When men came back from Vietnam, and as you mentioned, the lessons and the myths, there were certainly stigmas. Mm-hmm. There were stigmas that most Vietnam veterans were had a hair trigger, mm-hmm. were um, abusive, drank too much, perhaps were a little bit on the violent side, thought they all were John Rambo. So how do you diffuse that? Well, a lot of times by just having the vets themselves come in because I think that uh, when the kids meet the vets, they see uh, that for the most part, they're, uh, my experience with Vietnam veterans is they're very well adjusted. They're solid citizens. They are the cornerstone of the community. Um, the, the perception you would get from the media of the Vietnam vet is pretty much what you described there. And, of course, the media likes to depict things in a certain oh, yes. way for whatever reasons. But uh, when you actually meet the people who are veterans, um, and, and there's a whole list of them that are in your organization. I mean, Dave Samuels and those guys. I mean, I mean these these uh, Mr. Odom, John Odom. Sure. Th- these are leaders in our community. These are very solid citizens. These are not you know maladjusted uh, uh, people with you know a litany of, of of problems. I mean, we all have our problems certainly, but they're you know they um, uh, they're very solid citizens there, and very much a marked contrast of what you would sometimes uh, see presented in the media. Well, Russell, you know, we live in a, in a quick-fix society, as you well know. Win in the bottom line, win and lose. When you get to the session, or the part about Vietnam, and you start getting a class that has studied history, you've got all the wars, the 11, 12 wars we've been in, you've got the wins, the losses, and they come to that very hard question. We lost Vietnam. Now, that's a perspective I'm not going to take tonight, but ask you, I'm going to ask you the question. When a student would say to you, we went in Vietnam to stop communism. Vietnam now is a communist country. Win, loss, bottom line. We lost the war. How do you handle that? Well, I, I try to address that. I mean, if you look at it from a, a sheer win, loss, or a tactical versus strategic outlook, yeah, it was loss. If you go to Vietnam, and I have gone to Vietnam, it, it appears to me that we actually won the war because they want to be like Americans. So. Let's have a quick time out. We okay. have another caller. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, for Mr. Page, could you speak about how your students have been involved with the Bridgeback Orphanage Program? We've had uh, students in the past that have participated in that, and really uh, I'll let Bob kind of speak to that because uh, the Bridgeback is a program that uh, he has, uh, uh, along with uh, Mr. Dixon and other uh, uh, folks in the NCBVI, has really piloted there. Uh, but in the past, we've had good response from the kids on that. And I'll, I'll, Bob, sure. it's, it's a program that's near and dear to you, so I'll let you talk about that one. So. Thank you, Russell. The uh, Cary High School students, along with Athens Drive, and now Eastern Elements High School, down in, uh, I think I'm saying it right, Mebane or Mebane? Mebane, yeah. Mebane, North Carolina, um, have decided, decided to do an international pen pal where students come together internationally, teachers come together, and it was very hard to sell this. And then they started pen pals, and with the computer age, they're Facebooking back and forth all the time. And it is a bridge back, the bridge to understanding. And your class, with your leadership, paved the way. Because you showed them how to do the envelopes, how to make it personal, and how a kid in Vietnam will open a brown envelope in, the, in say, um, Han Yoi, Vietnam, Hoyan, Vietnam, excuse me. And they're almost in carry mentally, and vice versa. And I, I know your students this year are going to take part in this program again. So as I was getting to before, and you finish your thought, if you would, on um, the win-loss of Vietnam. Well, uh, it, it really kind of ties back into to, to that because Hoi An, uh, again, one of the places I visited when I was in Vietnam, um, 
But the the Vietnamese, uh, I, I like to say they're the most capitalist bunch of communists I've ever I've ever met. Uh, they they are very <coughs> business oriented. They work hard. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, I had the chance to talk to former Viet Cong and uh, 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 regular Vietnamese citizens. And when we kind of conversed in their English, a lot of times is, is surprisingly very good. Yes, very good. Um, we talked about socialism and communism, and they were kind of their understanding of that versus our understanding of that is quite different. Because I asked them, I says, "Well, you know, what does the government do for you over there if you don't work?" And they kind of look at you quizzically, like, "What do you, what do you mean you don't work?" You know, <laughs> I says, "Well, yeah, in our country, you know, the government will give you money if you don't work." And they look at me like, you know, I've just fallen off the turnip truck or the whatever. <laughs> And they said, well, you starve. I mean, over here, the government owns everything, but if you don't work, you'll starve. And they're very capitalistic. They are very business-oriented. They want American dollars. They want Americans there. They um, uh, they like Americans. They want to be like Americans. Uh, so when I ask a kid, if, 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 if we lost the war, it sure looks like we won when you go there and you talk to them in person. I said that the other day. It took us 40 years, but we finally did it. Yeah, yeah. Now, Russell, uh, one of the keys to this course, the lesson of Vietnam, to teaching the students at Wake County Schools is to, which you did, bring in the veterans and so forth. But the key a few years ago was taking the kids physically to the wall in D.C. We had an annual trip almost every school in Wake County, got on a bus and went to D.C. for two days. Now, this has gone kind of by the boards. And one of my questions to you tonight, and I want to kind of put you on the spot, by the way, is are you going to try to get this started again? Well, um, that kind of fell by the wayside after 9-11, uh, uh, and it really never got back on track uh, as, far, as far as we're concerned. And, and part of the issue is uh, the economics, and, and I think that's, that's uh, to some degree a consideration because we do have a lot of kids that uh, economically, uh, that is uh, kind of a hardship. But I do have kids that do go to D.C., that do go to the wall, and the class has been kind of an inspiration for that. Um, and, and that is part of the thing that I do encourage them that uh, outside of the classroom, the things they can do uh, that will enrich their knowledge of the course uh, is something I very much uh, uh, push for them to do. Um, that's something we can certainly think about in the future. Because what, what I was going to suggest, and I'm going I'm to bring this up at the Wake County Teachers Council next month, is I want to start to encourage field trips again. Mm -hmm. As a retired social studies teacher, I feel an obligation to take the social studies teachers today and let them go a step farther. Don't be afraid anymore. I mean, don't be afraid to take the kids to D.C. and go over and I trust the students. And if you can, the NCBBI will help monetarily. We'll come in, we'll help co-sponsor, buses, different things like this. And I would like you to pursue this. That's certainly something we can be we can be open to talk about, son. Very good, very good. Okay, moving on. I've got, now I've got a six-pack of questions for you. An Iron City six-pack. Straight from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, the rough spots, have you ever thought about bringing into class a protester or an evader? Actually go out and find one and bring them in. I, I have, actually. Please and go. Uh, one uh, in the past was a teacher at, at Cary High School. I won't say who it was. Sure, you, can. you can if you want to. No, I don't think she'd like <laughs> for me to say that. Because she was actually married to a Vietnam veteran. That, was kind, of a, that was kind of a source point at home. And she was one of those that, you know, when I was young, you know, I was against the war, I marched against that type of thing. Now, years later, looking back, and also being married to a Vietnam veteran, their perspective has changed quite a bit. So it's oh, no yes. longer, you know, we were out there and, you know, we were right to maybe uh, my approach was a bit rash and a bit uh, poorly thought out. And um, so I have had those commitments. But like I said, it is, it is harder to find people who oppose the war who are willing to talk about it now, which is kind of a complete reverse. It used hey. to be very difficult to find people who went to Vietnam who would be willing to talk about it. Uh, which I think is kind of an amazing thing. But, yeah, I'm always open to someone who wants to come in and kind of describe that because uh, if, if they were, I, I certainly respect their right to dissent. Uh, that's that's the right every American has. Um, and um, I think the kids need to hear that because truly those who protested and those who served were literally their age, I mean 17, yeah, 18 exactly. years old at the time. It's a very good perspective, and I think it's an obligation we have as teachers is to show the kids the whole menu. Mm -hmm. You can't just show them the steak. Mm -hmm. you got to show them everything. Now, when you go like this and you're going down with, with your students and you're planning your course and you have a perspective, you bring in the veterans, you attack the hard subjects, is there a part of Vietnam that you'd rather not teach? Well, no, not really. I, I, again, I'm interested in all of it and all aspects of it. Um, so there's really nothing that I, I, I would shy away from. Uh, I think we need to be critical in, in, in our examination of how we conducted the war, what we did. 
you know, we need to talk about things like my lie. That's and why uh, going to bring uh, up the atrocities. And, yeah. uh, but we also need to understand that that wasn't the worst atrocity of the war, uh, that when the communists uh, uh, took way in the Tet Offensive uh, early on, they massacred over 3,000 people. Uh, and this was a deliberate, planned execution. This was not done by uh, a, a poorly trained second lieutenant and uh, men who were under a lot of emotional duress uh, who reacted very poorly uh, at a given time. This was a planned, deliberate uh, attack by communists to do Absolutely. this. Um, and that sometimes, I think, gets lost because uh, it, it's very interesting to me how uh, uh, our textbooks and all doesn't look at how... Uh, deliberate and calculating the communists were in their takeover of South Vietnam. As you mentioned earlier, and so did Mr. Dixon, Vietnam used to have a small paragraph, and then Mi Lai had a whole page in color. Mm -hmm. And you brought up another perspective. When I took the survey of the teachers teaching Vietnam last year, the question I just asked you was answered this way. The subject I would rather not teach, but I will, is the atrocities in Vietnam, the ugly, the dark side of Nam, the racial problems, the drug problems, the prostitution problems, and the atrocities. And although these are the things you don't want to talk about, they're also very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so you must approach these and allow the students to ask the questions. So when you brief your students that veterans are coming into your classroom, what do you tell them about asking questions to veterans? Well, one of the things I, I coach the students on is to have 10 questions prepared in advance. Uh, and the rationale behind that is, and this has happened to me innumerable times, You'll meet someone interesting or um, famous or whatever, and you'll be so in awe or so sure. uh, uh, in the moment there that you walk away from that saying, gee, I wish I'd asked them that question. Right, and right. this is a way for them to have that prepared in advance. Uh, and I tell them, if you don't get a chance to ask your question or if they, someone else asks it, that's fine. I just want you to be prepared and have thought out what you want to ask and what you want to know about. Um, but I do coach them that um, certain questions border on privacy, uh, sure, you know, the sure. issues of, about drug use or that type of thing uh, are, are, are inappropriate because that's not a question I would ask them. So I have to have them look at it inwardly. Would they like to be put on the spot and ask those questions? Um, also, it's just not appropriate to ask someone, did you kill someone? Now, if you phrase the question, did you see violence or, or were there any experiences of Vietnam that you found you know, uh, distasteful or unpleasant or horrific or whatever, let the veterans kind of talk to their level of comfort on that. Excellent and some point. veterans are very very open about that. Others, yeah, less yeah. so. Well, you know, you also sat in on the uh, adult course at NC State, mm -hmm. the Encore course. I want to get your opinion on this. You've got people there in their 40s and 50s, and you're leaving the classroom of carry of kids 15, 16, and 17. What's your take on the Encore class with people want, wanting to learn about Vietnam 40 years later, and you're teaching kids that morning today? Well, the Encore class I thoroughly enjoyed because, uh, for the most part, I was the baby of the class there, and, and most of the people were older and were of that Vietnam era, either uh, veterans who had served or those who were the, the academic types who had been the, the protesters, that type of thing. Uh, you noticed that. And it was, it was good to get that perspective. Yes. Um, and I, I think especially for those who did not serve Vietnam and, and protested against it, I think it was more eye-opening for them to some degree to kind of get that perspective. Um, it, it's interesting, all these people have very strong opinions about Vietnam and about you know uh, how wrong it was. Never went there and never talked to anybody in depth about what it was like there. Um, and again, you can have an opinion, but my belief is that you can also have an informed opinion. I like that. And uh, uh, Well, the one guy I, I bring up as an example, and I know that you were taken back that night by it. The guy was obviously against Vietnam completely. Mm -hmm. And then we started discussing things. And he had no idea where Kent State even was. And he said, Kent State, what was that? He looked like he, he looked like a fool, but of course he wasn't a fool. But he came into the class to learn some things. And then when he started learning some things, he got very quiet. He, he stopped talking. And maybe that was what you're trying to get at. They came in to maybe learn some things, then form an opinion. Is that fair? Uh, uh, very much so, yeah. And, uh, but for, from my perspective, it was a great learning experience because I just tried to sit back and listen because I, I find I learn a whole lot more that way. And to get that broad perspective, especially from the people that were the more the academic types, the more uh, ones who had not had that firsthand experience, to kind of get their impressions was, was quite interesting. i got a tough one for you now, okay? Now, as I said before, and I've, I've told you this many times personally and on the air tonight, and I'll give you the phone number one more time. We have a few more minutes left of the show. Uh, give Russell and myself a call, please, at 919-518-9773. 
Russell Page teaching Vietnam in America. I found that when you teach Vietnam, you become a special teacher in the school. And then you take that attitude to your other classes. Your students that you teach them to ask the hard question, it gets contagious. Other teachers see you in the faculty lounge and they'll comment on the same student. They take the attitude you teach in the English class, in the biology. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I think there's a lot of cross-curriculum uh, uh, techniques you can use in the Vietnam class that can certainly be applied in other classes. Um, certainly the critical thinking skills, discussion, uh, debate, those types of skills serve students well in a variety of subjects. So. Well, Russell, your, your attitude is refreshing. My next question might put you on the spot. Is Have you ha had any time in your teaching career, especially teaching the lessons of Vietnam, where you were maybe... <clears throat> maybe told to be quiet and put in your place. Enough of that, son. Enough of that now. You know, not really. Um, I, I've, uh, again, very, been very fortunate. I've enjoyed a lot of support from my administration, uh, a lot of support from my colleagues. Um, so I've never really been told what to teach or how to teach it or what to say or what not to say. Uh, I, I try to sometimes ask provocative questions. Sure you um, do. And it is a controversial issue, and there are sensitive things that we talk about, but in the past, my experience has been that most students will kind of rise to meet that. They'll demonstrate a maturity level to meet that. Uh, not in all cases, obviously, but, but most of the times they will meet that standard. So, And, uh, yeah, I've, I've felt nothing but support. There and, again, go. a lot of this I will, uh, again, want to publicly thank you. You've been a, a mentor to me and uh, really helped uh, guide me in, in my preparation for the class and, and teaching the class. And and just the support from NCVVI has been really what's made the class, I think, uh, uh, what it is today. Well, one of our goals was to meet and try to find teachers like you. They were tough guys. They would teach the course in times when maybe people don't want to hear it. And when it took, it took so many years after Vietnam to get your foot on the stage. I mean, Vietnam was always interesting. It was always important. For 10 years, we, we've lost our minds. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, and th again, this is my perspective from, from, sure. from my experience of it, and, and, and certainly I'm sure other people's experience may vary. But uh, I think as a country, uh, when we went through the Carter years, there was a lot of uh, 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 defeatism. There was a lot of the, uh, uh, how, what did Carter call it? Not the melancholy, but the, uh, 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 there was the malaise, I believe it was. The, the malaise, Carter years, yes. the Carter malaise. Um, and, and certainly I was a product of that era, coming out of the Carter years and to the, to the, to the Reagan years. And uh, I, I felt like that... Uh, with the when the eighties kind of dawned, we got a different perspective on it. I guess sometimes it does take time to gather that perspective, um, and I think that's when you really started to see an appreciation for those who had served. I, I was in ROTC program uh, uh, in the early eighties, and I, I had nothing but support from my uh, classmates, from my faculty. And I went to a very small conservative uh, uh, Baptist school, so that probably had a lot to do with it sure, as well. Sure. And it was close to Fort Bragg, <coughs> of course, uh, but. Of course. Uh, but um, I, I enjoyed nothing but support uh, from uh, those around me. Uh, now, my wife, who uh, was an ROTC in a little bit earlier time in the late 70s at a larger university, she had some different experiences, certainly with some professors uh, there that were very anti-military, anti-Army. Um, but uh, uh, I think we really reevaluated uh, where we were as a country, and I think we gave and started to give at that time the proper respect, the proper due that the veterans were, were deserved all along. We certainly had to go back to the indexes of the books, didn't we? Yes. We'll put a little mm -hmm. more back there. Now, Russell, before I turn the show back over to Mr. Dixon to sum up and preview next week, I have one last tough question for sure. you. This was brought up the other day, and they were talking about the advanced technology, Telstar, the advanced photography from outer space, and, of course, they came up with the POW issue. Mm -hmm. A question for you. In your learned opinion, are there live POWs in Vietnam? There were POWs that were not returned to us. Uh, we know from uh, evidence that uh, there were a number. I, the number that sticks in my mind is about 496 that were taken to the Soviet Union and never returned. Um, it was certainly in the Vietnamese habit, and this had been done in the first Indochina War with France, where they would hold back prisoners in order to get certain concessions sure. from the French. Um, my belief, and it's unfortunate, is that there are probably no longer surviving POWs there because I think after they brokered their deal with Clinton, if there were any that had survived, they had, they had served their usefulness then, and they were probably executed. 
And there's no way we'll be able to prove that or be able to find that because the North Vietnamese government does not have, obviously, any interest in wanting that to be discovered. It's a burning question. But uh, that's my opinion. Um, how many there were, um, who there were, I, I, there's no way of knowing this. And, again, it's only speculation on my part, but the way the communists operate, it, it certainly fits their profile. Well, Russell Page, on behalf of the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans and the Bridgeback Foundation, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Thanks, sir. And tell you this, young man, you're a credit to the teaching profession. Well, I appreciate I'm, it. I'm jealous of you. Well, I appreciate everything you've done for me and done for the class, and, 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 and hats off to you. Mr. Dixon. I just got a couple of questions I want to uh, kind of go over with you. Um, as you mentioned a while ago, there was, there was a lot of myths, a lot of controversy, uh, and so forth in, in the Vietnam War and in that period of time. When you have students, it's an elective course. When they um, sign up for the elective course, uh, I know their parents are probably uh, a little bit apprehensive because of the some of the misunderstandings and myths and so forth. Do you have, uh, do you have much feedback from the parents as uh, their students taking the course? or It's been overwhelmingly positive. And uh, a lot of times I've had kids that uh, parents, and of course it's getting so, it's, it's typically grandparents now that served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's kind of sparked their interest. They want to know a little bit more about it because what did grandparents, what was his you know, uh, role in this? Uh, one of the projects I have the kids do each quarter is a veteran interview project, a VIP project I mm -hmm. call it. And, um, uh, and certainly I mean that in both ways because I think our vets are VIPs and should be accorded that treatment. But uh, it also, I encourage them to pick a family member who is a veteran or served because that's a piece of family history that uh, they can keep and maintain and something they can pass down to their children. Mm -hmm. And I've had quite a few kids come back to me and say, hey, this is something I didn't know about my dad or my granddad, and we were able to share this. So. Great. Uh, well, we're getting short on time, so I just wanted to repeat what Bob said. Thank you very much for you. being here tonight, especially, and for all you've done for the, uh, uh, the Lessons of Vietnam course. Uh, Bob mentioned also a while ago about the uh, question was with the Internet and so forth, uh, if it made it easier or, or harder. Uh, of course, everything that's on the Internet is always the truth. There's, never, <laughs> there's nothing on the Internet that's not uh, uh, just one hundred percent accurate in, in their sort of stuff, and I can imagine you have some students who will go on the internet and, and see something, and then you say something different in class, and it's uh, do they question you? Uh, 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 sure, what? They, they have questions. They have different opinions on things, and, and we certainly try to encourage them to, to, to speak about those, to debate those, uh, to air uh, whatever information uh, relative to the class they want to air. Uh, well, we have just, uh, Russell, we've got a little bit of time, just a little bit of time left. I uh, just want to remind everybody out there that's in the Raleigh, Wake County area, uh, we will be having the uh, Wake County and North Carolina uh, Veterans uh, Day Parade. It will be on November the 9th. It will be starting uh, so about 9.30. Uh, the parade will be starting about 9.30. Uh, there will be a, a ceremony after the parade that usually starts at 11 o'clock, being it's the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, come on out and uh, cheer for the veterans and bring your kids. It's a good time for the veterans. It's also a good time for you and the kids to see just what a veteran is. Uh, so many kids today think a veteran is something that you take your dog to when he's sick. Uh, show them what a real veteran is. and. Uh, uh, if you're a veteran, come out and march in the parade, uh, especially if you're a Vietnam veteran. Uh, come join North Carolina Vietnam Veterans. You don't have to be a member. Uh, come march with us in the parade. It's a great experience to see people out there who appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate you coming in, and uh, if you can't march, that's okay. We'll have some transportation for you uh, to help you get along. I know some of you Vietnam vets are getting old, not myself. I get younger every day. But if you have problems, uh, come anyway. Uh, get somebody in a golf cart to take you to wherever we are uh, lining up for the parade. But come join us. And, again, thank you for uh, participating in the show. And you can go and find out about the parade at www.ncveteransparade.com. Yes.
tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Sundays, 9 a.m. till noon. Carrie's Psychic Cafe with Carrie Silkowski, Sundays, 8 till 9 p.m. Health In with Debbie Brooke, Mondays, 11 a.m. till noon. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays, 1 till 2 p.m. Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members the second and fourth Wednesday of each month from 7.30 till 8.30 p.m. Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, Wednesdays, 9 till 10 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com.